So linearization, I've talked about this already. So I'll just write down what it means. If f is diffable, diffable at <coughs> x equals a, then linearization of f at x equals a is, so I'll use the L of x notation, so it's f prime at a, x minus a, plus regular f of a. So we've seen this before a few times. The most common error I see, this f prime of a should be a number. Not a function of x. So there should be no x's in it once you plug in your number, whatever a is. And this comes from y equals m. Right from here, you got a slope, you have some x value, and you have some y value. And our x value is a, our y value is f of a. So it comes from what you did in, I think this is algebra 1, or maybe even before. The only difference is our m is now a derivative. That's the only difference. It is algebra 1. My sister's going through it right now. All right. So it's a little interesting seeing this exact same stuff in calculus as she goes through algebra. I see. That should be an E. Linear. Oh, man. Linear eyes. <coughs> All right, so to linearize, and we're going to use this formula up here. So what is a good first step? What's the answer to most questions I'm going to ask you? Derivative. Derivative. So we're going to take derivative first. <coughs> so before I take a derivative, how should I rewrite this function? 1 plus x to the 1 half power. Yeah, so I want to use a fractional power. So don't leave it in square roots if you're going to be taking derivatives. So first, get the derivative. You have to use a chain rule, but you're going to find out it's not really significant here because the derivative of 1 plus x is 1. So the chain rule part uh, is not terribly important on this. And then figure out, once you get f prime of x, figure out f prime of 0. If you plug in 0 first, you'll get 0 for your derivative. So make sure your derivative first, plug in 0 second. We had all the pieces we need. So you should have gotten one half. Any questions on one half for your derivative? Or not one half. One half for the derivative was zero plugged in. Obviously, derivative is the line above. I could write the derivative a little bit nicer. <coughs> so 
So you could write the derivative like that, but it's totally okay to leave it in the form I had before. Would you not want us to run the one half through and do one half x plus, or one, one half plus one half x to the negative one half power? Like distribute the one half. To distribute the one half. Inside the parentheses. So if you do, you can. Uh, but if you do, I have to write one half as something to the negative half power, which I think is four. Is that right? Four to the negative half power is one half. Square root of four is two to the negative first power is one half. So now I can distribute it through. So I could write it like this, which is, or the original was, so however you want to write it, I mean, as long as you follow the rules, you're okay. Uh, you can't push it into the parentheses unless the powers are the same. So that's why I had to rewrite it as a negative one half power. Different story, if that negative half power wasn't there, if the one I just circled is gone, I wouldn't have to spend all that effort. Okay. All right, linearize this, so L of X equals F prime A, X minus A plus F of A. So F prime is one half A x is 0, so this is really our a value, a is 0, it's x minus 0, plus what is f of 0? I did that uh, at the top here, f of 0 is square root of 1, which is 1. Your linearization better be a linear function. If you linearize and give me a quadratic or a square root, well, I can tell you right away, it's not linear. So your linearization better be a linear function. And it'll always work out that way if you've done it correctly. Well, it better, or else you don't have a line. So there's no way you can say that's a linearization of anything if it's not a line. But would you put, like, does not exist if you couldn't work it out? Or is there if the function, the only time it wouldn't exist is if the function was not differentiable. OK. okay. Uh, and of course, if you're differentiable, it means you can plug in that x value as well. If you're differentiable, you have to be continuous. So the two parts of linearization that may fail in some cases, that if you can't take a derivative, uh, or if you, for some reason, can't plug in a. But we assume that our function was differentiable. So if your function is continuous and not differentiable, so you could plug in a but not take a derivative, an example of that is absolute value function. And linearizing at that point is pretty useless because what slope do you use? You could try 0, but that's a pretty bad estimate right there. Yeah, so you could use any of the slope. Well. You could use negative 1, positive 1, or Anywhere. 0. I mean that. Yeah, but there's not one choice. Whereas something similar, a parabola, you could linearize it right at the bottom. You'll get a horizontal line. And linearization is useful the further in you zoom, the closer it is to the function right there. Uh, whereas no matter how far I zoom in here, it's going to look like a V. Like it's never really going to be close. So you can linearize a smooth function or a function that has a derivative, but it doesn't make sense to linearize functions at corners where they're not differentiable. And of course, if you're talking about a vertical asymptote, you know, something like this, well, that's even, there's not even an x value defined right there, the vertical asymptote. So that doesn't make sense at all. Okay. Yeah. If there's no y value there, you can't, it doesn't make any sense.
So if I asked you to estimate square root 65, you didn't know any calculus, what's a pretty good estimate? About eight. About eight. A little bit bigger than eight. Well, we're going to get a little more specific about how much bigger than eight should this be. So we're going to, well, first of all, how did you know it was close to eight? So you know square root of 64 is 8. All right, so we're going to use linearization. Here's some stuff we know. Square root 64 is 8. What function do you think we should choose for f? So the function here is either case square root. So we're going to say f is the square root of x function. And we're going to do some calculus in a minute, so we'll write it as a half power. What is our a value? So the a value is a nice value you know, and we already wrote that down. So is the x value 64, or is the x value 8, the nice x value? 64 is the input for the function. Five, right? Well, the nice, so A is the nice value, oh. close to the one that we actually want to know about. Oh, okay. So I'm choosing, I could have jumped way up to 81, but that's much further away. So that's why we went down to 64 instead of up to the next perfect square. So to linearize, I need the derivative. I already have 8 is f of 64. So I already have f of 64. So I need the derivative, and then I need f prime of 64. So go ahead, get the derivative, and then plug in 64. Let's see what you get. Theoretically, you should get a relatively nice number back out. When I say relatively, it won't be an integer, but it shouldn't have some crazy square root that you don't know about. And then we're going to take all of these values and use the linearization. I recommend you write out the formula you're using the original way without any of your stuff in it, because in the case that maybe f prime is wrong and you put the wrong number in there, if I don't see originally where it came from, I can't, it's harder to give you partial credit. But if I see, oh, they're using linearization, but they sucked at their derivative. So bad that I didn't even recognize the number they got out of there. So I obviously won't give you points for taking an incorrect derivative, but I could at least say, ah, they know linearization, even though they don't know about the derivative. So I strongly recommend you write out, even though you don't have to, it's a good idea to write this out. Another thing, every time you write something out, it is burned a little bit into your brain. <coughs> so you, you will uh, remember it a little. Like burn's not the best word. I've been writing out the trig functions every day. Well, there you go. Is that helping? Yeah, yeah, it seems to. I can almost do it without looking at anyone. There you go. So it's uh, kinesthetic learning where you learn by the way your muscles are moving. So lots of different ways to learn. Of course, there's neurons going all the way to your muscles, biology, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so aside from getting partial credit, it's a good idea for your memory to write out formulas, even if you feel like you already know them. All right, f prime 64, 1 16th. Oh, I'll show you the wrong thing to do right here. I'll do it in red. If my computer cooperates. All right, so here's the most common mistake. 
I'll do the rest in regular color. All right, is this linear, a linear function? Nope, there's a square root in it. It's not linear. So it's not linearization of anything. So the problem is the most common error I see is people plugging in f prime of x, not f prime of a. <coughs> so don't put in f prime of a right there, or f prime of x. There should be a number here. So we'll take that back out. Now it is tempting to distribute this back out so it looks like mx plus b. Now a word of warning, I will not be impressed by your algebra skills to do algebra one. I will be disappointed if you do it incorrectly and I will take a point or two away, but I'm not impressed by you doing algebra one in calculus class. So you'll be wasting some time if you change a form and you risk losing a point or two or three if your error is, is horrible. Uh, there's another reason. So we got L of X right here. The other reason is we're using this to estimate basically L of 65. So I'm about to plug in 65 to get an estimate. So putting 65 for X. So that's 1 16th plus 8. So our estimate is, yes, a little more than 8. How much? About a 16th more. Um, and if we wouldn't use 9, it would have been just a negative number in the beginning. It would have been negative by... Yep, it would be some negative fraction. 16th. It would be and with a plus 9 on the other side. Plus 9, okay. And I could have used, if I... It would be a bad idea, but I could have jumped down to, what's the next lowest square, 49? I could have used 49, but I'd be even further off. It would be 7 plus a fraction. So we're going to go and graph these to see why this is pretty good. Now if I distributed it out, that's easy to do. 1 16th x. Is that my, 64 divided by 16 is 4, minus 4 plus 8 plus 4 like that. Uh, but now when I plug in 65, um, I will have a much better time estimating the original. And that's not exact, right? This is, this is a linearization. Okay. This is what this is not. This is an approximation for the square root of 65. Okay. So the square root of 65 is not 8 and a 16th. Right. It's close, but it's not exact. So if you, needed, if you needed that much, you know, whatever, inches of 2 by 4 or something like that, this would probably fit without a noticeable gap. Okay. But it's probably not close enough. If, yeah, if we were aiming to land on Mars, I'd probably do a little more work. Is that how, is that how you crash? That's how you miss, is that yeah. How you a uh, I think in space you just miss, usually, or crash. Yeah, you're going too like fast. The rover that missed the landing and got stuck. Yeah. <laughs> So let's go ahead and graph these out. I don't have my keyboard. All right, I'll graph them by hand. Oh, I do want to be able to zoom in and out on the graph. We'll go Desmos.
So our original was square root x. All right, so we got our square root function. I'm going to do my best to zoom into 64. All right, so at least from way back here, you can see they're not the same function. However, as I zoom in, somewhere 64. How close are they? indistinguishable on this, at least on this zoom level. Uh, if I zoom in far enough, I probably, with the thickness of the lines, won't be able to tell the two lines apart. So how close are the values? Pretty close. You could type in uh, square root 65 in your calculator, get a number, and then figure out in your decimal uh, what value that has. It, it was accurate to uh, the fourth decimal. fourth decimal place, so that's pretty good. Certainly if you're cutting lumber, I don't think you usually go past really one decimal place. Maybe two if you're making something really precise. Building a rocket ship, that's a different story. You probably need to go a little bit past one decimal place if you're just going to Mars. Of course, people building the rocket ships are not the people flying on them. They never are. So we're going to estimate to another All right, estimate cosine 5 pi over 24. Well, we haven't looked at pi over 24s before. So the question is, what is the next closest uh, nice value that we know about? So if it's hard to think about, that's because fractions suck because of their denominator. So 5 pi over 24 is relatively small. So let's just write down in 24ths, it's probably close to one of these three. So write these out in 24ths, and we'll see which one is the closest to. Is that right? Yeah, I got All right, so we have a choice right here. Which one do you want to use? And the answer, short answer is it doesn't matter which of the two you choose. So we'll go, I think we used the one that was smaller last yeah. time. Let's go with the one that's a little bigger this time. So I'm going to choose, they're both reasonable but I'm gonna make a choice and go with the second one. So our value is directly in between. So I'm gonna go with, we can go with either side, but I'm gonna go with the pi over four. And what is our function? It's cosine of x. I want you to do all the computations to get the linearization. You better know the derivative of cosine. If not, you got some memorization ahead of you before the exam. So if you don't know the derivative of cosine, maybe somebody near you knows it, or your notes 
about eight pages back, approximately. There you go. Cheat sheets are nice. Well, they're nice when you're doing your uh, homework. <laughs> if I say no, does that encourage more of you to get unit circle tattoos? <laughs> it's probably good for the local economy. <laughs> Make sure you're right. <laughs> Make sure your values are right. <laughs> Don't want it to look like your midterm with a bunch of erasing and scratching off. <laughs> I'm not sure what I would do in that case. It's a unit circle, obviously. <laughs> it's a unit oval now. <laughs> Any questions on the linearization process, derivative, plugging in? Now, if you leave your answer as <coughs> negative sine pi over 4, I will take off at least one point if you don't know your values or your unit circle. So you saw that happen on your quiz. If you left things a sine or cosine of whatever, even if it is the right value, you took the derivative correctly. But I will take off at least one point every time you don't tell me the value of a sine or cosine or secant, cosecant, tangent, cotangent function. So our x is 5 pi over 24. I'm going to just go ahead and write common denominator. Pi over 4 is 6 pi over 24. And 5 minus 6, that's a negative pi, making it positive pi over 24 times square root 2. All right, so the estimate is, yes, it is very close to uh, sine or cosine of uh, pi over 4. And how far off is it? It is that far off. Now, what number is that? Again, if you want to know what number that is, you have to use a decimal approximation for pi. 3.1415, however far you want to go. Square root of 2 is close to 1.41. So you can approximate all these things with decimals. How far into pi do you have to memorize? Not that far. Uh, there's no pattern, so in my opinion, it's not really anything other than a party trick to have that memorized. Less useful than knowing state capitals, for example. Also not very useful <laughs> skill. 
or memorizing the periodic table. You can just look at it. Yeah, but it's sort of arbitrary and it changes. It's not like I'm going to change the unit circle on you after you have it memorized. Right, or tattooed. Or tattooed. That would be rough. Yeah. Unit circle, that's much better to get than the periodic table. Who knows? You're going to have to keep getting additions to your tattoo. What's that? No. So they think? Yeah, it's, it's a crumb of world like Until like undiscovery yum or something like that. <laughs> so we chose, so our A was pi over 4. And we chose pi over 4 because it has a nice like sine or cosine value. Oh, but that's still a number, right? Yeah. So it's just, that's our slope. So it may not always be a nice, it may not always be a rational, a rational number, yeah. Like we saw 1 16th, uh, this is obviously it's a negative slope, so it's going to go downhill. Uh, it's close to, I think, negative 0.7 approximately, but it's just a number. It'd be bad if there was a x hanging out somewhere in there. Like if there was a you know, square root 2 x for some reason, that would not be a linear function anymore. So very frequently, your slope's not going to be nice. But no matter what, your slope better be a number. Or else you're not dealing with a linear function. Correct. Yeah, your midterm material ended in uh, implicit differentiation, which should be pretty obvious when you look at the review. It ends. I had to reorder it so implicit differentiation was, I think I had related rates above it, so I just switched the order. Okay. So I can just say 1 through 11 or whatever I said in the announcement. Okay. And I link directly to the discussion forums on the announcement so you know exactly like, where to go to ask and answer the questions you have on it. And obviously, you should have answered 1 through 5 already. So I said 1 through 11, but you really want to focus on 6 through 11. Can we also be asked 1 through 5 on the subject? Not directly. We'll see if you know the information. But you should, yeah, you should know the information. And you will definitely be asked some question from there, or maybe two or three questions on the final exam from that. So either way, you're not really allowed to forget any of that stuff. Yeah, I actually give you two and a half. And there's been very, very few students who actually stay for the whole two and a half. It's usually half an hour more than almost everybody needs. So your final exam, you will not run out of time. I think I've had maybe, maybe one student a year out of 400 or so that takes their final all the way to the end. Uh, I write a exam that's like a midterm and a half in length, so it should take approximately an hour and a half to do it, and you'll have an extra hour to do it. So most people finish within two hours usually. Or most people finish really within 90 minutes, but the bell curve, yeah. whatever, like that's where I cut. So there's like one student a year who's like outside of that right there, the cutoff time. So that is linearization right there. And I can ask the linearization question as estimate, some weird square root or a trig function of some value that you don't, some angle you don't, don't know about. So I may not necessarily say linearize this. So if you see the word estimate, you're going to estimate, estimate with a linearization. And when you do estimate, Make sure that you tell me, hey, this is the f I chose. Here's f prime. This is a. So you need to make sure that you tell me all these things. If all I see is a linear function and it's wrong, I really can't give you any points. So you want us to like, write out the equation so you start reiterating that to ourselves and then put right underneath it our actual equation with our. Yep, and I want to know what a value you chose and what it should be really really obvious what function you choose. Right. It's, you know, 
cosine or square root, and then see your derivative and all that. So if you skip right to this step and you're significantly wrong, all I know is you know what a linear function is. Uh, I don't know that I don't I can't see your calculus skills and I can't see that you really knew where it came from. So if like if that's your answer and it's wrong, I pretty much will give you zero points. Maybe I'll give you one because you know lin you knew linear. So if y equals f of x is a diffable function, the differential the differential is just dx by itself, and this is an independent variable. The other differential dy is a dependent variable. And how are they related? Of course, you've seen dy dx as f prime of x. So if we solve for dy, we can write it like this. So we're treating dy dx like it's a fraction now. And I'm multiplying. So we took that. And all I did was I multiplied by dx. stuff's not, not too bad. Uh, so let me talk about notation real quick. So if you just see d over dx, that's what we call an operator. So it's waiting for an operand. Uh, any function is an operator. It's waiting for some input. Uh, it's something that's going to operate. Uh, most of our operators operate on their right side. Uh, the only left operator that I really use is the factorial operator that factorializes what's to the left of it. Yeah. You can say, yeah, power is an operator. It sort of operates what's to the left and a little bit down. Yeah. Well, they're up higher, so they're what's down left is what they operate on. All right. So DDX is an operator waiting for an operand. So it makes sense to write something like DDX of a function. So it's going to operate and take the derivative of the function right here. And of course, you can write it f prime of x. <coughs> now when y equals f of x, you could of course write this as d dx of y, and you can also write it as dy dx. Now these two look really similar. So we'll talk about these two, the difference between these two. They mean the same thing, but on the left side, this is already operated. This is not an operator anymore. This has already been operated on. Uh, 
uh, on the right side, there's an operator and an operand. And this, on the right side, this is the result of the operator having operated on whatever function you have. And same thing, there's the operator and there's the operand, whichever way you want to write it. So I want to find dy if y equals this function and x equals 2. So what do I need to do? Take the derivative. So I need to take derivative here. So derivative left side is easy, just dy dx equals derivative on the right side, 3 times 5, 15x squared minus 4x. Now I'm going to solve for dy. So I want to find dy. Oh, look, here it is, but we have this little dx on the bottom. So we also have the information x equals 2. So now I'm done with my derivative, so I'm going to plug in 2. If I plugged it in earlier, my derivative would be 0. So I don't want to do that. So we're plugging in this value 2 every place I see x. Uh, no, so I don't know. I didn't get any information on how, how x was changing. I saw that x was 2, but I didn't know if it was growing, shrinking, and, and how much it was changing, basically. So if I, knew how if I knew x was changing by 1, y would change by 52 times that much. If I knew x was changing by 2, y would be changing by 104, basically. So if I knew how x was changing, I could say how y was changing, and actually vice versa. Right. So that's how y is related to x. Now this is also the slope. If I would have graphed this, the slope would have been 52. So super steep function right there. So there's, you know, a little change in x makes a huge change in y, because the slope is so steep. Yeah, so, you get 52, so yeah, if I move one to the right, I'd be going up 52. 